And I'd really like to thank also both the people who welcomed us, uh, Francis Miller for helping me pull together the hands-on. Um, the hotel, because we did cancel within two days notice last time, and they didn't stick me with the bill. <laughs> Yay. Um, <laughs> even they could have easily done, so we really want to thank the hotel for being as nice as they've been to us uh, the second time around. So, um, so without further ado, we'll get started. And our first talk is uh, Nicholas Stanley Price. Um, Nicholas Stanley Price is a member of the advisory committee of the non-Catholic Cemetery in Rome and edits its fringe newsletter. And we have both the newsletter and um, a, a review copy of his new book out on the table, one of the tables outside. Uh, he has recently published The Non-Catholic Cemetery in Rome, its history, its people, and its survival for 300 years. And he's the former uh, director general of ICROM. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jason, for the introduction. And it gives me great pleasure to try and talk about this different sort of cemetery in Rome, in Italy. Um, why does Rome have a cemetery for non-Catholics, for foreigners? Basically, if I remind you of the status of Rome in the 18th, 19th century, it was uh, part of the Papal States, administered by the uh, Vatican, by the uh, Holy See. Uh, and anybody who was outside the Catholic Church uh, was not entitled to be buried in consecrated ground, in Catholic consecrated ground, i.e. within the churches in the city or in any church cemetery adjacent to a church. Anybody outside the Catholic Church was not allowed to be buried there. So what happened to them? There was an area outside the walls to the north of the city where people outside the church, such as suicides and prostitutes and criminals, were buried. And that's where Protestants would normally be buried too, because <laughs> they were outside the church and they were considered heretics. But during the 18th, 19th century, there were increasing numbers of Protestants coming to Rome as part of the Grand Tour and others who came for other reasons uh, connected with the uh, exiled Stuart Court of Britain, many of whose members were Protestants, not Catholic. And so during the 18th century, they developed a place for Protestants to be buried with, as we now know, the permission of the Pope right from the start. That was very uncertain for a long time and really it's only research of the last two or three years which has confirmed that it did have the permission of the Pope from the start. Now, one of the best known of these Protestants who died in Rome and needed somewhere to be buried was the Romantic poet John Keats. And on the left, you see the house on the Piazza di Spagna uh, on the Spanish steps and the actual room, which is now part of the Keats Shelley Museum, where he died. And there he'd been looked after for many months by Joseph Seven, the painter. And Keats knew how close he was to death because he had studied medicine. And he asked Seven to go down and visit the Protestant cemetery, as it was called, to tell him what it was like because he knew he was going to end up there pretty soon. And Seven came back saying it's the most beautiful place with grassy lawns covered with day daisies and violets, which were Keats's favorite flower. And Keats said uh, he couldn't, where well, he could almost feel the flowers growing over him. So 
Keats died in February 1821, and there is his grave in the Protestant cemetery. And Joseph Seven, unfortunately, had another task the next year when the other fellow romantic poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley, was drowned off the coast, uh, north, from north of Rome. And Shelley, after he had died, was painted by Joseph Seven, composing his poem in the Baths of Caracalla, and there is his grave on the right. So the graves of the two romantic poets, Keats and Shelley, are the most visited graves, at least for all poetry lovers and most Anglophones who visit the cemetery these days. So the term which we prefer to call it now is the non-Catholic cemetery in Rome because it's not exclusively for Protestants and hasn't been for a long, long time. On the right, you can see a view taken in about 1900 showing the extent of the cemetery. There's the chapel, which I'll talk about later, built in 1898, and then the large area of cypress trees, often associated with cemeteries, and at the other end, its terminus is marked by the pyramid. I'll explain the pyramid in a moment. And I stress that it is still an active cemetery for those who qualify. How do you qualify? You have to be non-Catholic, non-Italian, resident in Italy. And those who meet those three, three criteria can be buried there today. I should also add that many of the people buried there today are descendants of those who qualified, and of course through intermarriage with Italians and so on, in fact, there are quite a lot of people buried in the cemetery who are Italian and Catholic. Whoops. Just for those of you who know Rome, just to show where it is, and those of you who don't know Rome, let me know when you're coming. <laughs> it is right inside the ancient wall, the Aurelian Wall, third, I'm sorry, third century AD. There is the pyramid I just mentioned. It's inside the ancient walls, and I stress it's inside the walls because I often read that the cemetery was created outside the wall. It's not. Uh, right on the southern fringe of Rome. Here's the main station. Here's the Colosseum, Piazza Navona, Vatican, top left, just to give you an idea of where it is. The first recorded burial is in 1716, and the first stone monument was at least surviving stone monument, uh, dates from 1765, which was the grave of George Verpup. George Verpup was a young German on the Grand Tour, and you may be surprised if I tell you how he died. He died in a road accident, falling out of his carriage as it toppled over as they were leaving Rome, and unfortunately he and his valet were killed. So he is the first burial to have a stone monument erected to him, and he is in the old cemetery, which is in the shadow of the pyramid. This is the shadow of the pyramid, so it's just on our right. The pyramid is the oldest monument in the area. The pyramid dates from about 18 BC. It's an ancient Roman monument, and appropriate enough, it is a tomb. It's a tomb of a man we know very little about called Caius Gestius. We really only know about him from inscriptions on the pyramid. Um, but he left instructions that when he died, he wished to be buried in a monument built in the form of a pyramid. And there he was. And that dominates the old cemetery, where it all started, including that tomb we just saw, 1765. And on the right, you see the so-called new cemetery begun in 1822. And you see the clear difference between the two, that the old one looks a bit more like a churchyard that we're used to here or in England whereas the uh, view on the right shows a much denser layout of tombs uh, in the new cemetery. Why the big difference? Because in 1822, the Pope said, no more burials in the old cemetery. I will give you a new piece of land, almost adjoining to the right. I'll show you a map in a moment. And the reason the tombs that the Protestants were erecting and the trees that they were planting were obscuring the view of the pyramid. And the pyramid was always seen as a very important, even though it's pagan, a very important monument to all Romans, and there had to be public access, public land to get there, and the Protestants were diminishing the view of the pyramid. 
And it was for that reason that the Pope said no more burials in the old cemetery. So to give you an idea of the layout, you see the contrast again between the old cemetery here in front of the pyramids, relatively few graves, about 70 graves in the old part, and then the very dense, dense layout of the new cemetery, uh, which uh, is still the active part nowadays uh, and laid out in the form that you see. So we're looking from the north from this plan of the 80s and the next plan is going to be seen from the next from, from the other side from the south again we have the pyramid here and the old part and this is just to explain how the cemetery developed over the years this is the so-called new cemetery the plot of land which the pope assigned them in 1822 and it started to be used then and then there was an extension as the space was used up in 1856 which covers this bit and then the final extension in 1894 including the erection of the chapel, which I mentioned before. And since 1894, there have been no extensions. There's no space in which it could extend. And so all burial activity since 1894 has been taking place in this area. Hence the very dense accumulation and layout of the cemetery that you have seen. You see one or two other uh, points like Keats's grave and Shelley's grave, just to give you an idea of where they are. Now, I stress this is a private cemetery. If we're talking a bit about the management and the status of the cemetery, it is private, but, of course, subject to all regulations, both of the city and of the uh, government of Italy, so national and city regulations. There are about 2,500 tombs existing in about 18,000 square meters, which I think is about four and a half acres. Tell me if I'm wrong. I think so. Um, and there have been more than 5,000 burials so far and still increasing. Of course, the 2,500 tombs that you see nowadays are not the 2,500 tombs that have always existed because of recycling. And unlike in many countries, uh, you don't necessarily have a grave forever unless you purchase your concession on a permanent basis. And so there's been a certain amount of recycling in the past, and I will come back to that later. Now, who governs the cemetery? Essentially, there is a board of 14 ambassadors to Italy, which was created in 1921, includes both USA and Canada, and they elect a president who holds office, one of the ambassadors who holds office for one or two years, and then they change. The current president is from South Africa. There is a staff of two and a half. Current director, Amanda Thursfield, two support staff in the office, and a handyman, half a handyman. And everything else, like burials, gardening, conservation, is outsourced. Of course, when I say outsourced, I don't mean it's just left to look after itself. It's very actively managed by the director. And then we have a visitor center, which is increasingly active, and that's staffed by volunteers. Then there is an advisory committee of five members with different areas of expertise, which was created in 2006. The advisory committee meets with the director every four to six weeks. Now, you might think that sounds very often, and poor director having to meet with these people every four to six weeks to justify herself. Not a bit of it. It works extremely well, and uh, she relies on the advisory committee. They, advise on, uh, they rely on her. And this date, 2006, is quite important because it was set up following recommendations made about the future of the cemetery. Because if I had been giving this talk in 2005, I'd probably be telling you that there's a strong risk that the cemetery will have to close. It had got into a very difficult situation, mainly financially, and there were serious questions being asked about its viability and whether it would uh, continue. So in fact, what I'm talking to you about today is really I won't say a success story, that may be being a bit too optimistic, but at least it's brought the cemetery back from the brink uh, under the directorship uh, for most of the time on, of Amanda Thursfield. And so the situation I'm presenting now is an outcome from the crisis of 2004, 2005, when ECROM was invited to initially to do a report on the conservation needs of the cemetery. 
And once we looked at the situation, we said, uh, conservation is very important, but fran frankly, if you're not going to reorganize the finances, uh, this cemetery is not going to survive. And so that's why this advisory committee was set up in 2006. And unlike so many reports which are produced and then sit on shelves, the recommendations of that report, I'm glad to say, have been largely followed and implemented. And the whole cemetery is on a much sounder basis now. And then what I sh what will tell you during the rest of my talk, in a, sa in a sense, reflects the uh, direction uh, of the current director and the advice of the advisory committee, always under the board of ambassadors, but they have a fairly hands-off role unless they are called in for particular uh, important questions which only the president can decide. What is the protective status of the cemetery? As early as 1918, it was declared a monument of national interest. It's protected under Italy's heritage law. It is inside the World Heritage Site of Rome that was declared as long ago as 1918. So it has varying degrees of national and international protection. And as I said before, we're subject to all the policies of the uh, city in terms of uh, vegetation, rules about what, what you can do with trees, about replacing trees you take down, and of course, uh, with all legislation concerning burial as an active place of burial. So many, many obligations, but no public funding. Maybe a situation some of you are familiar with. Now, of those 2,500 tombs, we reckon that about 80% of them have no one paying for them at all. So they are the responsibility of the cemetery in terms of conservation, maintenance, keeping them in good order. And even though there may be no one actively paying for them, no active families uh, paying for them, you never know when a descendant might turn up one day and ask to see the tomb of their ancestors. So it helps to have kept it in uh, essentially good shape. So I'll talk a bit about what is the significance of the cemetery, what sort of funding model do we use, and what sort of conservation model do we use. It is a highly, highly significant cemetery. There's no getting away from it. It's been called, uh, years ago, it was called the Cemetery of Artists and Poets. I've al already mentioned Keats and Shelley. Uh, many, many painters who came to Rome, or writers or sculptors who came to Rome because of the attraction of Rome, and uh, either lived there to, the old, to their old age and died, or uh, fell ill and died and were buried in Rome. And one of the more recent ones, Gregory Corso, who died only in 2001, the last of the beat poets. More artists and poets, a Russian painter. I'm sorry our Russian colleagues couldn't be here um, to see some of their compatriots buried there. Um, American diplomat George Marsh, George Perkins Marsh, not only a career diplomat, but also author of Man and Nature, who really first drew attention to the impact of man on the environment and Gottfried Semper, uh, famous for his buildings in Dresden. And then in many works by known sculptors, again, people who'd settled in Rome, perhaps best known Thorvaldsen, uh, and then William Wetmore Story from the States. Um, sculpture has not been studied as much as it deserves. Some of the best known ones have been studied, but there's a huge scope for more study of the uh, sculpture in the cemetery. And, of course, many, many painters having settled in Rome uh, and perhaps having got to know the cemetery because one of their colleagues ended up there, uh, found it a very attractive place to depict. Here you have uh, an engraving by J.M.W. Turner before he had visited Rome himself for the first time. He, he used someone else's drawing uh, to do this um, depiction of the pyramid. Uh, two blobs of white on the drawing the blobs on the right are sheep, and the blobs on the left are tombstones, and then various people admiring the view uh, inside the walls, and you see so what a rural place it was in those times. Uh, a man called Scarabalotto, who painted this in 1840, showing the first new cemetery before it got extended. So historically quite interesting too, that he shows exactly where it extended to. One of the earliest photographs in Rome, again, showing it after the first extension of the 1850s. It's just been built. It hasn't been used yet. Young trees, very important historically. And then various painters uh, painting individual tombs. 
either of their friends or on commission. This one was probably on commission from Russians living in Rome uh, by a painter called Salomon Korodi, who was Swiss. And the last one, a picture of the tomb of Shelley by an English artist, uh, William Bell Scott, of about 1873. And, of course, for many, many other people, apart from those who are celebrities in some way, famous for something, many, many other people who feel that the place is significant to them because of having someone who is buried there, or an ancestor who was buried there. Uh, the bottom left is the tomb of Richard uh, Dana, author of Two Years Before the Mast, a great classic of sailing. All the faiths in the world are represented there, starting top left, Buddhists, uh, Muslims, Russian Orthodox, Jewish, and then in the middle at the bottom, the tomb of Antonio Gramsci, the political philosopher, co-founder of the Italian Communist Party, uh, born a Catholic, not practicing a Catholic by the time he died, uh, but in fact he's buried there in a family tomb of his wife, who was Russian Orthodox. I put this in, uh, seeing that in the program there was to be a talk about the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. I'm sorry he couldn't be present. Uh, before the special cemetery on the right, which is in fact adjacent to our cemetery, was established during the Second World War, uh, a few casualties uh, of the First World War are indeed buried in our cemetery in the image you see on the left there. Then just to give you some idea of some of the Americans who are buried there, the painters like Benton, Crowninshield, Freeman, Luther Terry, John Tilton, Elihu Veda, and sculptors, Wetmore Story, Richard Reno, Franklin Simmons, and so on and so forth. And then various writers, I just mentioned Richard Dana, Gregory Corso, the poet, Marsh, Thomas Jefferson Page, we'll see his tomb later, who was a commander in the Confederate Navy during the war. Meade, the only one of the three partners of McKim, Meade, and White, who lived to see their building in Rome, the American Academy, actually finished and open. He's buried there. Zilla Richter, the great specialist on Greek face painting. Sarah Parker Raymond, uh, abolitionist and speaker. Uh, on abolition, whom we'll mention later, and Hayek was a composer. So huge natural values, too, when we're talking about the significance. Uh, it's one of the commonest remarks from visitors, having arrived in the cemetery and walked around, that it is such an oasis of peace and quiet and green, having been used to thronging around the sites of Rome with all its traffic. And it is indeed an oasis and therefore quite a haven also for wildlife, uh, and also for cats. One of the protected colonies of cats in Rome is just adjacent to the pyramid, and we have a nice symbiosis with the ladies who look after the cat colony, uh, and many of the cats have particular areas of the cemetery that they're always in, and they're extremely good at posing, <laughs> as you can see. So huge numbers of reason that reasons that make this place significant and very much admired by the people who visit it. So, again, emphasizing the date of 2005, because I think it's only from that point that we can talk seriously about long-term planning as opposed to keeping things going from day to day uh, on a basis that proved to be non-sustainable back in 2005. And as you've already seen, the, the staff is extremely few. It's two and a half people managing all these contracts for the other functions that the cemetery has to uh, carry out. So preventive conservation underlies the whole approach as being the most cost-effective, constant monitoring of condition, and then intervention uh, as needed uh, and when the funds uh, allow uh, by conservators working on contract. This is a slightly different model to a few years ago where there was a staff conservator, but we've reorganized many of the functions like that uh, with the advantages and the disadvantages of having work done on contracts, but we use usually the same one or two conservators on contract whom we know, and therefore there is a, a continuity, even though obviously the contracts are put out for competition. Any family can ask to have their tomb cleaned, and they then pay for it themselves, and it's done by one of the conservators contracted to do so. And then we feel the obligation to adopt um, 
whichever tombs of artistic historic importance deserve to be restored or in need of restoration, and then we feel the obligation to raise the funds uh, in order to make that possible because there's no one else actually looking after those uh, tombs. So it's a mixed strategy. In some, some ways it's uh, partly long-term planning, but in many ways it is opportunistic. And I'm sure uh, many of you may be thinking, well, what's your long-term plan? Do you have a management plan? Do you have priorities? And the answer is yes and no. A lot of it is opportuni opportunistic. You take the opportunities when they come up. If someone is offering to finance the restoration, you don't say no because it doesn't fit into your current priorities. I'm sure many of you are used to these sorts of considerations that go into your daily work. So it is frankly uh, a mixture of, as I say, deliberate planning and opportunistic uh, taking up opportunities when they come up. Just to give you two examples of conservation of buildings, so mainly I'm going to be talking about conservation of tombs, which I think is probably of greater interest. Uh, it's a very fine uh, chapel built by the Germans in uh, 1898 when that last extension of the cemetery was acquired in 1894. A very good solid building used for funerals for people being buried in the cemetery, but also now especially uh, we encourage other people to make use of it for appropriate purposes, uh, sometimes for funerals for people being buried in other cemeteries elsewhere and they like having access to this sort of environment. In 2009, we finally managed to have the window glass restored in the way that it should have been. The window glass was blown out, not all of it, a lot of it was blown out during the Second World War uh, when the Allies were bombing this part of Rome. And uh, a certain amount of damage was done to the cemetery uh, and the window glass was temporarily restored at the end of the war and only in 2009 were we able to acquire the same glass that had been used in 1898, which was still being made in Germany, and we placed it in the windows of the chapel. In one other building, uh, the autopsy room. As far as I can work out, the autopsy room was not used for very long, maybe 20 years at most, uh, and was then largely unused. And just uh, last year, this year, we've had it renovated. It's just one small room, but with a nice skylight, flooded with light, and we've renovated it in order to use it for services to visitors for welcoming groups, perhaps when it's raining, it does rain in Rome, um, or for having little exhibits, perhaps. Uh, anyway, opportunities to welcome people other than our visitor center, which we also have. But I'm sure um, the alteration of tombs, the deterioration of tombs and their conservation is of, of greater interest here. Starting top left, uh, just surface alteration as a result of atmospheric pollution and the very high humidity levels that exist in many parts of the cemetery, particularly those parts which are most heavily vegetated. And in terms of rainfall, I might just mention that the annual rainfall in Rome is higher than it is in London. It comes in different ways, but in total it is very high. And then top right, uh, obviously invasive, higher plants, ivy, controlling it so that it doesn't get to the stage of damaging the monuments. Uh, bottom left, um, uh, grave of a Swedish sculptor, Bistrom, uh, where the vegetation adds to the attraction of the grave, but we'd always monitor it to make sure that it wasn't getting to the stage of uh, threatening the tomb. And in fact, since uh, we took that photograph, it has been cleaned. Uh, you see the effect there of the lead incised lettering on the gravestone uh, and then the streaks um, below the letters as a result of uh, resulting that pattern of different surface alteration colors uh, because of the lead, uh, the water streaming off the lead down the stone. And then on the right, um, the amount of actual destruction, I'm glad to say, is relatively little for reasons I'll give in a moment, uh, but that's just a photo of uh, storm damage as long as uh, 30 years ago now. Uh, you can imagine with the closely serried ranks of tombs, when one of those trees uh, does fall, it does cause quite a lot of damage. So to prevent that, uh, we have to take preventive action. Just summarizing the main deterioration factors, all of which will be familiar to you. Uh, just the physical impact, the micro microbiological growth, 
uh, some tombs structurally unstable, corrosion, metal fixtures. I'm glad to say uh, vandalism is rare, which is a function of management, as usual, uh, increasing visitor impact. And so those some of the, some of the deterioration factors uh, found, I guess, in all cemeteries. Looking at the vegetation, uh, obviously there's regular maintenance carried out uh, by the usually two gardeners a day of the contracted uh, gardening services who've been with us now for several years. But many of these trees are old. Uh, cypresses, as we know, are a very long-lived uh, species, as indeed the pines can be. And uh, in order to avoid the kind of damage we saw in that previous slide, uh, and which did recur every few years with very high storms, we uh, just to give an example of the age to which cypresses can grow, on the left, drawing of this tomb of a Scot, who was in fact called Scot, here, and here you see the same tomb here. We know that when Shelley's ashes were buried there in 1822, Trelawney, who was responsible for the burial, planted six cypress trees around Shelley's grave. And I'm pretty sure that the cy cypress trees that you see there are amongst the six that he planted. So they are 180 years old. And we have another example in the old part of the cemetery where again, there is there's one cypress tree left, which I think is also about the same age. Occasionally we do have snow in Rome and because of it not being common, its impact can be all the greater. And so uh, this was one uh, tree that was brought down by a very light snowfall, uh, but immediately the fire brigade intervened and within 24 hours, everything was cleared. But therefore we need to take preventive conservation for trees, especially the tall pine trees, uh, which would cause a huge amount of damage if they fell. And we had a tree survey done in 2006 of all the trees in the cemetery in order to assess those that were at risk and to avoid just that sort of situation. And the only way to remove these very large trees from that area of very closely uh, set uh, rows of tombs, because you cannot get equipment inside the cemetery in those places, is to hire the largest crane in Rome and to do it from outside the walls, taking them down from the top. <coughs> very expensive. Not the sort of thing you want to have to do very often. But it has to be done chiefly for safety of staff and visitors, and then secondly for avoiding damage to the tombs of the cemetery. Another tree problem, the red palm weevil, as we know, started um, now quite some years ago, about 15 years ago, in Asia and has spread the whole way across the Middle East, uh, arrived in Mediterranean Europe, and I read has reached California about uh, two years ago, uh, fatal for palm trees. And under local laws in Rome, uh, any palm tree that is found to be infested with the red palm weevil must be uh, taken down immediately and burnt. Uh, and despite all the best measures, a large number of palm trees in Rome have been affected. And in this case, uh, there were two of them in front of the chapel. And one came down early on and we tried to rescue the one on the left, the second one, uh, by feeding into, uh, feeding into its crown um, pesticides but without success, and so both of them have now been lost. Just an example of the different materials which are used for monuments there. We're talking about marbles, travertine, uh, pepperino, which is a volcanic tuff, a few of sandstone, granite. Um, the gilt bronze on the right, uh, the bronze uh, in the middle, and then the gilt bronze, and the gilding, which is a tomb of about 1880. Uh, I emphasize that has not been re-gilt. Uh, on careful cleaning, it was discovered about 90% of the original gilding was still there. Rome is a very polluted city, unfortunately. And in the year 2000, the pyramid uh, was cleaned uh, by conservators. And this is how it looks like uh, in 2011. 
Another cleaning of the perimeter is going on right as we speak, sponsored by a Japanese businessman. That's what it looked like last week. On the left, with half of it cleaned, and that's the result of only 12 years' exposure. So I'm taking groups around, and I show them the cleaned area and the uncleaned area, and I ask them, when do you think the pyramid was cleaned last? And they usually say about 50 years ago, if ever. And when I tell them it was cleaned in the year 2000, they don't believe me. That is the atmosphere that is affecting the pyramid and therefore all of our monuments in the cemetery, which has a big impact on conservation needs. How do we fund conservation? All the people who hold active concessions to a tomb in the cemetery have to pay an annual maintenance charge. Uh, if you ask me, it is uh, almost 400 euro now, which is, I think, about $500. There are new concessions, people buying concessions, uh, which are for 30 years, which then would have to be renewed if the family wants to. And the cemetery earns a very little overheads on burial fees. And then we fundraise, for, as I said before, for conservation of specific tombs. And we have a friends organization and produce this newsletter, which has a lot of news about uh, what's going on in the cemetery. It's also an opportunity to try and explain to people what conservation is. It's not just taking the household cleaner to a tomb or um, water blasting them. It's a technical field which is carried out by properly trained conservators with a great deal of care. And so it's an opportunity to explain that uh, while also raising funds and talking about uh, having articles about interesting people buried in the cemetery uh, who aren't particularly well known otherwise. There's a common misconception that these embassies, which make up the governing body, pay for the cemetery. Unfortunately, no, if only it were true. But a few of them, the ones I've listed there, are quite good at giving occasional grants, maybe every year, like Germany and Russia, uh, for conservation of tombs of their nationals in the cemetery. Never very much, but enough to have one or two tombs of their nationals uh, conserved every year. So we're very grateful to those countries that do give us something. Institutes, museums, there may be a museum in the native country of one of the artists who died in Rome, who still retain the interest in that artist as having died there, and occasionally they would give us money to maintain or even to restore the tomb of that artist in the cemetery. We've had one or two collaborative conservation projects with other conservation institutes. And the most important of those is the one that we have now with ICROM and the Getty Conservation Institute. Every two years they have their international stone conservation course and we collaborate with them uh, in order to provide fieldwork opportunities for that course. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, as I say, we have the friends who uh, can become members at different levels of subscription and therefore those funds are also available for conservation of tombs that we think of as priorities. And then there may be descendants or individuals who have a particular interest in certain tombs. For instance, the Keats Shelley House helps to pay for the maintenance of the tombs of Keats and Shelley and Shelley's family members. Grant giving foundations, uh, as an obvious candidate. I can say, frankly, we have not had much luck with grant-giving foundations making generic applications for conservation or even for specific tombs. We've found that those who have a particular, co a, a particular connection with a tomb, a family connection or a cultural educational connection, are far more likely to give money than a grant-giving foundation. And I don't know what your experience is, but uh, we have found that sometimes cemeteries are a real dead, that's the wrong word, uh, really uh, not uh, acceptable to lots of grant-giving foundations. There's a blockage about them. I hope I'm wrong. And then there are visitor donations. Uh, we do not charge a fee for visitors. We ask for donations. It's a suggested donation model. And so we get now increasing amounts of voluntary donations from visitors. Some give, many don't, but it all helps. Just to give you some examples, uh, the tomb of the Russian painter, Karl Brulov. Uh, I don't like to show just before and after. There's a great deal that goes into uh, 
producing the result on the right after cleaning the tomb of Bulov, which is by a well by a known uh, sculptor that is recorded. In this case, being done by the uh, conservator, who was then on staff as the staff conservator. Just to give you some idea to you conservators, the sorts of methods that may be used on a tomb. It depends ab obviously on what are the problems of that particular tomb, uh, and uh, more or less of these methods or variants on these methods might be used in any particular case. So from survey and documentation, surface cleaning, filling in cracks, uh, removing particularly uh, surface crusts, biological treatment, and so on and so forth. Um, final consolidation if needed, but not necessarily with acid silicate, and always detailed, detailed documentation for the record. This reflects pretty standard Italian conservation methodology. And as you know, in Italy, the conservation tradition is extremely strong and uh, there's a fairly good consensus about what constitutes good practice uh, and what should be followed. I mentioned this joint collaboration with DCOM and the Getty Conservation Institute. We have jointly, we choose which tombs are going to be worked on. Um, the first was in 2011, the second last year. And the cemetery insists, insists that whatever work is started must be completed because we do not want to be left with half-finished tombs when the course finishes. And so it's a requirement that if work is not finished by the time the participants, who are international conservators from all over the world, go home, then the ECOM and the DCI must pay for the rest of the project to be completed. Uh, huge benefits to the cemetery and to the partners. Because of the laws in Italy, they would never be allowed to work on a Italian state property. The International Stone Course was held since 1976 in Venice, and during all of those years, they were never allowed actually to do hands-on work. With this cooperation with the cemetery, they're allowed to do work in the cemetery, which has been approved by the authorities in Rome, with whom we maintain very close contact, and therefore they are able to do practical work with huge benefits to the course, of course. Benefits to the cemetery is we get six or seven tombs each of these years uh, restored to very high standards by these international participants. Uh, on the left, you see a conservator from Palestine uh, working on the base of a monument, and on the right, you see a conservator from Croatia also at work in 2013. Just another example from 2013, this tomb, uh, top left, I think, compress is being applied with ammonium carbonate for cleaning of the surface after the condition mapping has been done, as you see on the right, uh, and then the finished tomb, bottom left. I mentioned Thomas Jefferson Page earlier, who was a uh, captain in the Confederate Navy, and on the left, you see the situation before, uh, very badly deteriorated. You couldn't even tell the difference between that gray marble in the background and the white marble of this rather fine Art Nouveau figure, which is by a known Italian sculptor uh, who was commissioned in 1900, 1899, 1900, to do this tomb for the Page family. And again, an example of raising funds externally through the sons of Confederate veterans uh, who raised the money not only in the States, also through their chapters in Spain and Germany, where there are very active chapters of the SCV. Other American sculptors, uh, Franklin Simmons and William Wetmore Story that I mentioned earlier, uh, looks like a before and after. On the left it is, the top left is before, that after it had been restored in the year 2000, and after, it's as it is nowadays, that's only 12 years of exposure to this very humid environment and the pollution of Rome. And again, we've been trying to raise money to do uh, yet another restoration of Simmons' uh, sculpture, the Angel of the Resurrection, but very expensive because of its height, uh, requiring extensive scaffolding. The problem with the Angel of Grief, which William Wetmore's story did on the right, after his wife died, when Story was already a man of 78, and he himself died 
uh, 18 months later, and is also buried there, is that it has become too popular. We use it in some ways as an icon of the cemetery, but it's also been used uh, by various goths uh, to become an icon for heavy metal fans. <laughs> That's why we have this notice saying that people are under uh, video surveillance, please do not touch. And those of you with sharp eyes, uh, which is not me, um, may see that there's a half a finger missing uh, on that hand. It's been missing for quite some years. And under the policy of the Sopintendenza, we are not allowed to replace it. And the adjacent finger was knocked off by a visitor about four years ago. And someone pointed out that another finger has been broken off. And 10 minutes later, a visitor walked into the visitor center and said, look, look what I found just below the hand of the angel of grief. And it was this fragment of the finger which had been broken off. So we were, we were allowed to put that back. But the other finger we're not allowed to restore. As I say, it's become an icon for goths. If any, any of you remember Evanescence from Arkansas? Um, that's on their album cover. And Nightwish from Finland. And there are one or two other uh, bands which have also used the photograph without permission uh, for their album covers. And a number of copies of the sculpture exist, uh, most of them in the United States, but not all. Uh, one was made uh, for the Cotinet Cemetery in Montreal in 2003, one and a half times life size. And if you want to read an account of how this was done, if you look on our website, there's an account by the sculptor uh, of the really quite extraordinary operation they undertook in order to install this copy of the Angel of Grief for the Remillard family. I just mentioned we're not allowed to replace that missing half finger. This is Italian restoration philosophy. In this case, which I think is a particularly unfortunate one, the tomb of 1908, Norwegian lady who died quite young. Um, we have photographs of it just after it was installed. She had quite a lot of the cemeteries still not occupied, it's still empty space. And we have photographs from the 80s showing the sculpture and early 1990s someone during the night knocked the head off not to be found again and we are not allowed to replace this even though we could make a really quite convincing copy of it so that's that's the that's the approach that's uh, the ethos with which we operate we have to operate now i mentioned earlier the problem of recycling of tombs and you can imagine this very enclosed space, very limited space, which has not expanded since 1894. And in a country where uh, Catholics too only, require, only acquire a right for burial in the ground, usually for a sh very short period of time until the remains are exhumed and put elsewhere. And I mentioned that uh, nowadays, at least, the concessions are for 30 years in our cemetery. And this often is difficult to understand by people from countries where once you have a grave, you have a grave forever. And because of the space problems uh, in this cemetery, uh, there have been at least two phases in which a number of tombs were recycled. In the 1930s, so 30 years after uh, that last extension of the cemetery, uh, the director then uh, decided a large number of graves either with no stones on them or stones which are in bad condition would be recycled, and 600 graves were recycled. And then there was another phase in the 1990s when quite a lot of graves were re recycled too. And I think the grave of Sarah Parker Raymond, who was this uh, extraordinary lady who uh, earned a reputation for speaking against uh, slavery in uh, the 1850s, 60s uh, in the States, and was such a good speaker that she was asked to go on a speaking tour to Britain, which she did. There continued her own education in London until doing a career switch, as it were, and decided to study medicine in Florence. And then she practiced medicine in Florence before late in life marrying uh, an Italian uh, and eventually moving to Rome and dying there. Now, from an old inventory, uh, we were able to confirm what people had always said, that she was buried in the cemetery, but unfortunately her was one of the graves which had been recycled, and so there was no visible uh, evidence uh, in the cemetery of her having been buried there. 
and that entry from the uh, inventory uh, refers to her name, ex explains where her grave was, five rows below the tomb of the poet Goethe, and then Azumata, she's been exhumed. So the evidence was certainly there that she, her grave had been removed, and a lot of people thought this was uh, extremely unfortunate, and so as a result of a fundraising campaign in Salem, Massachusetts, where she was born, uh, we now finally have a commemorative plaque to her erected just a few months ago. Many of the stones from these uh, graves that were uh, recycled were put into a kind of uh, graveyard along the walls of the cemetery. Uh, but if you think about 600 tombs that were exhumed, some of which would have had stone uh, markers uh, in the 1930s, we only have a tiny, tiny proportion of those in this area along the walls, and many, many others must have uh, been removed in the past. Nowadays, we're very strict about, as I say, only working in agreement with the families that at the end of their 30-year concession, they have to decide what they want to do, whether to take out a new concession or to agree to have the tomb removed. But it is one of those most controversial aspects of cemeteries, particularly in these sorts of uh, conditions, and uh, one especially, uh, it's very hard to, you can't undo things that have been done in the past, and, for instance, when a relative contacts us and asks us about a grave and it has been removed, it's always a slightly difficult moment. So even during the 1930s and more recently, all of these are recorded and there's always a record of who has been moved. It's usually a record of the inscriptions on the graves, uh, so we know what those were, not in all cases, but in many. And some stones were saved, for instance, uh, this is no longer here nowadays, and I assumed it had gone until, to my surprise, I found the gravestone leaning against the wall at the back of the cemetery. So some of them are still there, but most of them have gone. And these plaques were put up uh, in the 1930s, listing all the people who, uh, with their date of death and so on, who had been removed and put into the ossuaries uh, on the, in the cemetery. The ossuaries were also used for those who were too poor to have their own gravestone uh, or own burial place, uh, but are buried in the ossuaries. So just quickly, uh, in terms of visitors, to increasing number nowadays, um, that acts as our sort of guideline as to what the aims are. It is first and foremost a cemetery, and that must always be the main consideration. These are Russian graves with tulips on them during the day of Russian commemoration. Many commemorations around particular graves uh, on the left, you have Germans going around the graves of a number of art historians, famous art historians who died in Rome. Uh, there's Thomas Jefferson Page at the top before it was cleaned, uh, a celebration again by the Sons of Confederate Veterans. And then at the bottom, some Swedes around a Swedish grave. I'm glad to say that many local residents now, Catholic, Italian, come in because they see it as a nice, quiet, green space, uh, either old style to read the newspaper or new style to read, use the computer, um, and just using it as a place of quiet and relaxation. Then we have our visitor center, which you see on our left there, which originally was the office and chapel back in the 19th century, now converted into the small but adequate visitor center with publications and postcards on sale and database of all the people buried there, which people can consult many guided groups, many, many schools, universities, uh, and other cultural associations come. Uh, and uh, we either provide guides if we are asked to on appointment, on reservation basis, uh, or people bring their own guides. Um, and even a few nuns who tend to be well-behaved visitors. Uh, and that's been a summary of many aspects of the management and conservation of this rather particular type of cemetery. Uh, I hope it's spurred some thoughts in some of you, must have ring, rung a lot of bells with your own experience, which I look forward to hearing about over the next few days, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you.